Good morning and welcome to Scotts Hill. My name is Phil Ortigo. I serve as a senior pastor here at Scotts Hill. It's been a joy being here all these years. Those of you who are watching us online, we're so glad that you're able to join us today. This last week, I celebrated a birthday, and as I've done that, I had a couple of gifts that came in through people in the life of the church, and two of those gifts were t-shirts, and one of them is this t-shirt that says, come at me, bro. <laughs> so I thought it was appropriate for me to wear this today. Those of you who have not been in the Revelation series, you're thinking, what does that mean? You will find out a little bit later about what that means. I was just trying to find all kind of ways to pick out my, old, my own clothes today. And my wife says, you can wear that, but you let me put the ensemble together. And she has done it for you today. So take your Bibles open to Revelation chapters 12 and 13. We are still in this interlude before the seventh trumpet blows and all the wrath, bold judgments come pouring out. And as we're in this interlude in chapters 12 through 15, what we see is that John sees seven visions. And today we're only going to look at um, three of those seven visions. Now, as we're continuing in our study in the book of Revelation, let me remind you of the ground rules here. Sometimes people will forget about these things. My goal in preaching the book of Revelation is not to take all of the symbolism from apocalyptic literature to break it down, to analyze it, to assign dates and times and people and events to it. That is not my job. My goal is to paint a picture of the overall meaning of the book of Revelation. Remember, it cannot mean to us what it did not mean to the recipients of that letter. Now, if you want to go and study in more depth, I would encourage you to do that. If you want to look at all the symbols and the nuances, you just need to know this that many good scholars disagree on all of those things. And the reason we're not diving into that is because we have probably all those positions represented in people in this church. So we want to look at the overall picture of the book of Revelation. And the overall picture is this. It's a word of encouragement to believers who are suffering and persecution at that time and believers who will be persecuted to the end of time. It's a book of encouragement. It's also a book to extol us to stay in the fight, to be courageous, to be fearless when it comes to preaching the gospel regardless of what culture is doing and what is coming at us. And so we are to remain to be faithful and fearless in this. And the third thing it's always a reminder that God is sovereign. He's in control of all things which should drive us to a place of worshiping Jesus, regardless of what happens. All through the book of Revelation, it's a book about worship from beginning to end. And so that's the theme of the book of Revelation. That's what we're settling on. Now, there's a second thing that I need to remind you of, is when you study apocalyptic literature, rarely does it follow any chronological order. It's not linear in design in that one event leads to the next event to the next event. We do see that six seals are open, which leads to the seventh, which leads to the seven trumpets, which that seventh trumpet leads to the bold judgments. We do see the linear line in that. But when you look at it historically, it's hard to follow a linear line. What's important is not what happens next. Listen, what's important is what John sees next. And what John is about to see in his interlude are seven visions and so we want to unpack that. Today, we're going to look at three of those seven visions. And what I want us to look at is what we call the unholy trinity. We're going to look at the unholy trinity. Now, today is Reformation Day, but it is also Halloween, right? And many people are getting geared up to celebrate Halloween this evening. We did not choose to preach on the unholy trinity on Halloween, that was not something we looked at the calendar and said, oh, let's do it on this day. It'll really be scary. No, that's not at all what we did. The Holy Spirit has orchestrated this. And so when we look at chapters 12 and 13, we're going to get a picture of the unholy trinity. Now, let me tell you what John is doing in chapters 12 and 13. He's pulling back the veil. He's helping us to see that behind all the events of humanity, there is a spiritual warfare that is raging. And this is a spiritual warfare that has been raging through the ages. 
And you can see that major events throughout human history, you can see such travesty and devastating events. And behind that are spiritual forces that are constantly working. And when he pulls that veil back today, we're going to see this unholy trinity that is currently at work in the world, but we will see it in an intensified way when we come down to the last days. So here's what I want to do. I want to break these two chapters down and to give you the three persons of the unholy trinity. Here's the first one. Satan, the adversary of God and of his people. Satan, he is the first person of the unholy trinity. Satan in this unholy trinity is to mimic God. God is father. Satan is the father of what? The father of lies. And so he mimics the, 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 the position of father, but he is the father of lies. And in chapter 12, we see all through the chapters broken down into three different sections, but it's all about this enemy, this adversary. And we discover some very important things about Satan all through chapter 12. And so I want to show you three important things that we need to know about the adversary who has got his heart set against God and his people, three truths that we need to know. Number one is this. Satan seeks to destroy God's plan for redemption. He always has. Satan seeks to destroy God's plan for redemption. Since the very beginning of time to the very end of it, Satan's heart as an adversary is to come against the plan of God. Now, in chapter 12, there are three characters that keep popping up all through this chapter. And these three characters are very significant. There's a woman, there's a child, and there's a dragon. And so what I want us to do is see what each of these characters, who they are and what they represent. First, let's take them in the order that they appear. Number one is the woman. Verses one and two. And a great sign appeared in heaven. And a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and her head, On her head was a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains in the agony of giving birth. Now, there's the woman. The woman obviously is a picture of Mary. This is a wildly different nativity scene than what we read at Christmas time. We usually go to Luke's gospel, chapter 2, and we read through it. But this is wildly different because here's a picture of Mary. But it's not just Mary. It's also a picture of Israel. And it's a very important picture of Israel because we see that there's a sun, there's a moon, and there's a stars. It's reminiscent of the dream that Joseph had about his mom and his dad and his brothers. And it's a picture of the birth of Israel, but it's a picture of both Mary, who gives birth to Christ, and Israel, which is through the line that the Messiah would be born. And so we see it's a picture of not only Israel and not only Mary, but also it's a picture of the body of Christ from all ages from that, for, that point forward. That's, that's the woman, okay? Now, let's look at the next one, which is the son. And that is in verse 5. And she gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But a child was caught up to God and to his throne. This is obviously a picture of who? This is the easiest Sunday school answer at church, okay? The easiest one. It's a picture of who? Jesus. It's a picture of Jesus. And we see in Isaiah that he is going to rule and that the government will be upon his shoulders and there will be no end. Where it talks about that he'll be caught up to God, it speaks of his ascension after his death and his resurrection. So this is a clear picture of Jesus. And then the third character is the dragon. And this is a picture of Satan. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. How? Have any of you ever read this to your children on Christmas morning? (laughs) No, just a picture there. And it's a picture of the red dragon whose heart is set on destroying the Christ child. And all through the rest of chapter 12, we see this repeated over and over again. 
His heart is bent on destruction. In the second section of chapter 12, we see that there's a war in heaven and that Satan and the angels are cast down. That's reminiscent of what it's saying here, that he threw a third of the stars down. Those are the fallen angels that went with him. He's a red dragon, which symbolizes his murderous character. It says that he has seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems. That's a signal of his authority and his power that has been granted to him. And he stood before the woman is about to give birth. And when she bore her child, he might devour it. Here's the thing that we see. That it is Satan. And in verse 9, it says this. It says that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. Here's the picture from the very beginning of time. Satan has been set against the plan of God's redemption. We see it there in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve as he tempts them to pull their hearts away from their devotion to God. We see it when he led Cain to kill his brother Abel to try to wipe out the line and the lineage of a child to come. We see it all through the Old Testament when Saul tries to kill uh, King David. Ataliah, who is the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, tried to wipe out the whole line of Judah, but God preserved Joash. We see Haman trying to kill all the Jews, but God raised up Esther. And we see even in this passage that Herod was on the pursuit to try to kill the Son of God by slaughtering children in Bethlehem up to two years of age. But what did God do? God moved them to Egypt into the wilderness where they were protected for two years until they came back. Here's the reality. The devil is a murderer. The devil is a liar. The devil is the adversary of God. He is set on doing everything he can do to thwart the plans of God. But in every single way, he has always failed. He's always been a step behind and God is always sovereign over him. He is seeking to destroy God's plan. But since he can't do that, verse 17, then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. And those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus, here's what it is. He can't get God, so he's going to go after his people the people who love him, the one people who trust his word, the people who are followers of Christ, he is going to go after them. And here's the second thing we need to see about Satan, that Satan seeks to discredit God's people. You see, he can't destroy the plan of God, so what will he do? He will discredit the people of God. How does he do it? Look at verse 10. It says, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. This is a full frontal assault on believers. Satan is never going to rest when it comes to people of God seeking to obey him. He's going to do everything he can to accuse them and to render them powerless for the kingdom's work. He is the one that brings back two things to our minds. How does he accuse us? What does he accuse us of? Usually two things, either a word that has hurt us or a wound that has hurt us. And every one of us have words and wounds in our life where we know those things have hurt. It may be a word from somebody in the past. It may be a word that I wrongly perceived and I thought it was a certain thing. It may be a wound that I experienced. Somebody hurt me. It may even be a self-inflicted wound where I openly rebelled against God and now there's guilt and there's shame. And he wants to use our failures to paralyze us. Let me give you some ways he does that. You can never be used by God. I can't believe you rebelled and you disobeyed God about that thing. That sin that you committed is unthinkable. God would never use you. And you believe it. And you're rendered powerless for the kingdom's work. And that tape plays in your mind over and over and over. And you think you will never, ever be capable of doing anything for the glory of God. It's a lie from the enemy. Because your acceptance by God is never based upon your performance. It's the performance of what Jesus did for you on the cross. And you're free. Some of you are thinking, I can't get out of this addiction. I can't get out of this temptation. 
I have failed over it and over it and over it. And the enemy comes to you and he says, you're trapped. You'll never be used. You will never arise to the character of Christ. Just forget about it. Just do you. And don't worry about anything else. It's a lie from the enemy. And he accuses us. And that is not true because you have the Spirit of God who lives in you and is able to do exceedingly abundantly far beyond anything you ever ask or hope or think according to the power that is at work in you. You have freedom, but we don't walk by that. Somebody told me I'm not smart enough and I can't understand the Scriptures. I can't read God's Word. I don't understand God's Word. And so I'm just not going to read God's Word. And you become powerless to that and you no longer get involved in reading the Word of God. But you read other things. You read the newspaper. You read anything that comes from Chip and Joanna Gaines. You can tell me all about that ship lap. And, uh, and you know that. And it's a lie from the enemy. And the lie is this. You'll never, ever, ever be able to understand and you have everything within you that's necessary for life and for godliness. Several years ago, I was flying across the country. I was speaking at an FCA conference in Topeka, Kansas. And I was a keynote speaker there. And I was flying from one airport to the next. And I landed in, a, in one of these layovers. And I had about two or three hour layover. And I ran into a man from our church here who was about to get on a plane. But he had all these miles. He flies all over the country. And I think he had access to what was known as the crown room, you know. He said, well, Phil, Phil, don't, don't, don't hang out here with all these peons. Come with me. Come with me. And so I followed him. He opened these double doors, and there was this plush room. I mean, lazy boy recliners and a buffet and water bottles and all this stuff, plug-ups. And, man, it was quiet. And so I left all those little people, common people, and I went to that crown room with him. And when I walked up there, he went up to the lady. And you know what? I had none of the qualifications for that. I had no right to go into that crown room. But when I walked to her, he said, this guy's with me. And he put down his little crown card and she scanned it. And she said, welcome, sir. Come on in. He said, you know what? I've got to go catch my flight. You stay here as long as you want. Took me two days to catch my plane. <laughs> I had no qualifications to get into that crown room. But he did. And I was with him. Let me tell you something. The devil will tell you. And it's true. You have no qualifications for the crown room of God's glory. You have no right to be in the presence of God. And he is right. But what we can do is look the devil straight in the face and say, you're right. I have no authority. But the Lord Jesus does. And I'm with him. That's the truth. The devil wants to accuse and render you powerless. And he has no power. Here's the third thing that we need to see. Satan is a defeated foe. I love this. Satan is a defeated foe. For the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. You know how many times in that passage it says he defeated? Five times. Five times in there it says he's defeated. It says in verse 8 that he is defeated in heaven and he has no place for him in heaven. And then three times it says that he was thrown down out of heaven. Twice in verse 9 and one in verse 10. Thrown down. I love that phrase, thrown down. In the Greek, you know what it means? It, it kind of has a colloquial language to it. In the Greek it literally means Satan was bounced. He was bounced out of heaven. He was thrown down to the earth. He is absolutely defeated. And Satan is defeated because of two reasons. Number one, he is defeated by Christ. Jesus has already defeated him. In verse 10, and I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority in Christ have come. When Jesus came, he defeated Satan once and for all and on three different levels. First, the birth of Jesus declares Satan's end. The death of Jesus defamed Satan's threats and the resurrection of Jesus disarmed Satan's power. Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 puts it this way. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. 
It was Jesus whom Satan wanted to put to public shame as he hung naked on the cross. But as Jesus hung naked on the cross, he disarmed and put them as a public spectacle that they have no power. Then Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, very in the beginning of the garden, we see what's called the proto-evangelium. I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's speaking to Satan. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This literally in the Greek means he shall crush your head. He's defeated. But not only is he defeated by Christ, he's defeated by Christians. He's defeated by Christians. Notice what it says in verse 11. And they have conquered him. Who's they? Believers have conquered him by the blood of the lamb his atoning work on the cross, and the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Let me tell you what the enemy wants to do. He wants to destroy you. He wants to persecute you. He wants the world to put you to death. But when the enemy comes at us and he wants to put us to death, it's his own demise and it's our delight. I love what David Platt said about this. He wrote these words. When Satan uses suffering and persecution to defeat Christians, he ultimately contributes to their eternal delight and his own eternal destruction. He's right. He's right. When Satan comes after us and he uses people to kill us, we step into the glories of heaven. And everything that we have ever lived for and hoped for is now a reality. The rewards are given to the believer and there's nothing that can keep us from the delight of what God has for us. Paul writes in Philippians 1.21, to live is Christ, to die is what? Gain. Come at me, bro. <laughs> it's gain. Put me to death. Gain. Government persecute me, gain. World hate me, gain. And while it may be his plan, it is always our delight. That's why the Apostle Paul could write at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I have said this for years here, and let me just repeat it again. And I repeat it until my last breath. We, as Christians, do not fight for victory. We fight from victory. And we are always his. And so we can all get a t-shirt like this. And not in arrogance, but in absolute assurance that we are his. You know how Paul ends up Romans chapter 16 in verse 20? When he finishes his letter to the Romans, he says this, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Our enemy is a toothless, clawless lion who can only roar. And for those who are in Christ, we are eternally secure, and we are His. So the first person of this unholy trinity is Satan, the adversary, and he is a defeated enemy. Aren't you glad of that? Aren't you glad of that? Let me give you the second one, okay? As we continue on in chapter 13, we see two other personalities of the unholy trinity. And the second one is the Antichrist, the agent of Satan. He's the Antichrist. Now, I know most of you want me to spend an hour just on this one. But we don't have the time, but I'm going to give you what you need to know. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, it says, And I saw a beast. This is the second vision that he has. The first vision was he sees the woman and the child and the dragon. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. Now let me just say something. In the book of Revelation, nowhere is the word antichrist ever used. It's never used in the book of Revelation. Matter of fact, it's only used in two books when we come into the New Testament. In the book of Daniel, he's seen as a little horn in Daniel chapter 7. 
The beast is seen also in Daniel chapter 9 as the prince who is to come. In 2 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 2, Paul calls him the lawless one and the man of sin. In 1 John and 2 John, he refers to him as the Antichrist who has come into the world. All through the book of Revelation, he's known as the beast. 35 times he's called the beast. The word Antichrist is appropriate because he is against Christ. Now, many people will say, who is this Antichrist? Does he represent an empire that's evil and it comes against the world? Is, it this, is this just simply the spirit of evil in our world and will always be there? Or does it represent a person who will be satanically inspired, supernaturally empowered in the end times and will be a leader, maybe even a religious leader, who is going to come and deceive many people and point them to Satan? My answer is yes to all of those. I believe it's all of those things. Because throughout history, we have seen governments come against Christians and raising up policies and all kinds of principles of where they're persecuting believers. Many governments have risen to that. We see that all around the world. We even see that in our own government, as I'm going to share in a couple moments. So, yes, there are evil empires that are bent against Christianity. Is there a spirit of evil in the world? Absolutely. Go down to a Planned Parenthood clinic and you will see the most atrocious evil that you could ever see that taken a life of a human being all the way up to the point of birth. Don't tell me that's not evil. All you have to do is follow some of the movements in our own culture. Just look at the LGBTQ community and how it has opened itself up to the expression of sexual relationships with, between any human being for any reason at any time. But now they move beyond that. Do you know that LGBTQ now is embracing a new movement where you can have relationships between a human and an animal and they're calling it zoophilia? That is rising even in our culture. We can see all through what's happening in our world that there is a spirit of antichrist. But there is going to come one in these last days who is going to be, I think, is going to be very charismatic. He's going to be very cunning. And he's going to be very cruel. And how does he work? He works the way he always works through history. And he's going to do the same thing when he arises. The Antichrist works through governments that function as divine authority instead of under divine authority. The Antichrist is going to come and set himself up as the divine authority rather than working under God's plan of a divine authority. Now, this is Revelation chapter 13, but if you go to Romans chapter 13, here's what you'll discover. You will see in Romans 13 that God is the one who orchestrates the governments. He's the one that sets them up as a tool of his accomplishments, and they are set up by him to be under him. But what we're beginning to see even in our world today is the jettison of authorities working under God and claiming to be their own authority. We see this all around us. In this last year, just think what has happened in our world where governments have come and they've jettisoned the principles of God's word. And what have they done? They've taken full power and control for themselves. Look in the last nine months of what has even happened in our own country and how quickly we have devolved from being a government under God to a government that becomes its own God. Even in our Pledge of Allegiance, one nation under God, we saw last year how that was taken out. And we see that there's a huge movement today to remove under God completely from the Pledge of Allegiance. Why? Because we want to be our own authority. And I'm going to tell you, what you're seeing happening today is a setup of what's going to happen when the Antichrist comes. And when he gets there, it's going to be a smooth transition because it's already taken place. And then what we see is that this is what he looked like. And to the dragon, he gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. 
And they worshiped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth and uttered blasphemies against God, blaspheme his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. And it was also allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it. And everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life in the Lamb was slain. Every person, every person who is a child of God will recognize and refuse to worship this Antichrist. He's going to be cunning. He's going to be charismatic. He's going to be cruel. And then you read in later in a chapter, this says, if anyone has wisdom, you can discern his name because he has a mark and his number is a name of a man, 666. Now, I want you to know so many people have speculated over the years over that and people have always been wrong about it. And we don't know who he is. We don't really know where he comes from. But the point is this. There will be a man of lawlessness who is going to mimic the person of Jesus. And that mortal wound that he has is to seek to mimic the person of Jesus who died, was buried, and rose on the third day back to life. This mortal wound is going to be something where it's going to be mimicking that he has died and he has risen. And just as Jesus was submissive to the Father and he pointed people to the Father, the Antichrist is going to be submissive to Satan. And he's going to point everybody to Satan in such a way that people will be so deceived. The Antichrist, the Spirit is already here, but he's coming, and he will be deceptive. So you've got Satan, the adversary. You've got the Antichrist, who's the agent of Satan. But then here's a third one, the false prophet, who is the accomplice of the Antichrist. He comes alongside the Antichrist. He points people to the Antichrist. And we see in verses 11 and 12 of chapter 13, then I saw another beast, this is the third one, rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. Now, this is really significant. He comes as an appearance of someone good, but he's evil. He comes like a lamb, but he's a dragon. 29 times in the book of Revelation, the word lamb is used. 28 times it refers to Jesus. Only here it refers to this false prophet. And what is he doing? He's spewing heresies and he's pointing people constantly to Satan. It says that he exercises all authority of the first beast in his presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. Now, as you read through there, you will see he does all kind of supernatural things. He does all these kind of signs. He even creates an image of the beast, and he gives the beast, that, that image, the ability to speak. There's technology today that's happening that does that even now, and it's scary. And what we're beginning to see is that all of this creates this unholy trinity. He is going to speak on behalf of the Antichrist. He tries to mimic the role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit points to Jesus. Jesus points to the Father. The false prophet is going to point to the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to point to Satan. And there you will begin to see the whole world deceived by it. It's already beginning. The numbers of churches across the world who are no longer preaching the gospel are preparing the way for false prophets. The number of churches around the world and even in our own culture who no longer care about the truth of what God's word says, that no longer hold to a biblical worldview, that want to be more contextualized than they want to be sanctified. And then what begins to happen is all the groundwork is being laid for someone to just step in and to deceive. The unholy trinity, Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet. Now, some of you here this morning are thinking, man, I would never give in to that. I would never listen. I would detect those things immediately. But let me say something to you, and I'm going to say this with all love in my heart, with all the kindness that I can muster, and with the seriousness that I can verbalize. Listen carefully. 
If you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you're still living your life on your own, my friend, you are already under the unholy trinity. You're already under them. You just don't know it. You're already listening to the lies of the enemy. You're already being deceived by the antichrists that are in the world. You're already buying into the lies of heresy that lead you far from the truth of God's word. And as a result, you've jettisoned all the things of God. You think what you're doing is right, and yet you're already in the grips of Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophets. There's not much work left to be done because you're already there. In fact, let me say this. We were all there. By birth. That's why the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of, rest of mankind. Every single one of us. Listen carefully to me today. There are only two kinds of people in this room. There are those who are walking under the power of the prince of the air, and there are those who are walking under the power of the prince of peace. It's only two places. You are either giving in to the things of the world and listening to the lies of the enemy, thinking, I got plenty of time. I'm in charge of my own life. I'm in control of what happens. I don't need a shirt come at me, bro, because I'm coming after you. And you don't even realize that you're already under the wrath of a holy God. And Satan's scheme is to keep you so blinded and your heart so hard that even now some of you are wanting to fold your arms and say, this is ridiculous. My friend, all of those are just simply marks because I was there. Every person in this room was there. You see, there are only two sides of the cross you can be on. You could be like the thief that cursed Jesus to his death, or you could be like the thief that surrendered and said, remember me. And the most important thing is what side of the cross are you on? Here's the good news. Here's the good news. God loves you so much that he wanted you to hear this message today. He loves you so much that he wants you to know that you can enter into that crown room with him as you bow before him. Would you do that today? I mean, really? Would you be like that thief on the cross where that last resisting bolt is turned loose and you surrender your life? To the one who loves you. Satan doesn't love you. He hates you. He despises you. He wants you in eternity separated from God. Oh, he comes as an angel of light. But his domain is darkness. And today the Lord Jesus is saying, no, no, no. Don't go there. Here I am. Come to me. Surrender your life to me right now and you will know the prince of peace and no longer be under the power of the air and for believers believers listen we don't need to be afraid we don't need to be afraid the enemy's defeated we're fighting from victory and not for victory and one of the key passages in, in, in Revelation 12 is verse 12, and it says this, Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. His, the enemy's destruction of us will be our greatest delight. Here's the power of Christ in you, that the moment you die, your greatest desires are going to be fulfilled in the presence of God. I love doing funerals. In fact, I would rather do a funeral than a wedding. Now, I'm not against weddings. Just hear me. I did one Friday. 
But I love funerals, and here's why I love funerals, for two reasons. Every Christian funeral I do, and every Christian funeral I will ever do, is always a testimony of that saint, that brother and sister. They are now in the presence of God, and all of their hopes are realized, and this to their eternal delight. And the other reason I love to do funerals is because at weddings, not many people are thinking about death except maybe the groom, but not, <laughs> not many people are thinking about death. But at a funeral, everybody is thinking about the reality of death and the gospel gets to be shared in power. So ch child of God, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. What can the world do to you? Rejoice, what can the enemy do to you? Rejoice, what can the governments do to you? Nothing that will impact your eternal destiny. So we stand and we rejoice. Would you stand right now as we close out and as we sing and as we declare that we have no fear? And the truth is we don't have to wait, church, until eternity to sing. We don't have to wait until eternity to stand and proclaim. We don't have to wait till eternity to join with the saints through all the ages. We can do it now and we should do it now. And the world should hear us. The demons of this world should hear us. Satan should hear our battle cry. And our battle cry is always from the praise that goes to our Savior who has loved us, who has freed us, and who has given us the victory. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to pray and we're going to sing. Father, thank you for the truth of your word and the encouragement that we've seen today. And Father, while many people will read the book of Revelation and be afraid, we're reminded constantly that all those who think they're in control, Father, are simply under your sovereign hand. And that you're working and directing all things after the counsel of your good pleasure. And Father, for those today without Christ, I pray, Father, that your spirit would so speak to their hearts and convict them that they would cry out to Jesus for forgiveness and that they would give their lives to him this day and to be under his loving care for all of eternity. Father, teach us the song of heaven, that it'll be on our lips as we live here, that Father, just as it is in heaven, Father, it will be on earth for us. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.